good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here for this uh, presentation. So as Peter said, uh, my name is Aid Lars. I'm from Delft University of Technology. And um, in uh, my group, we uh, develop uh, solutions that uh, enable bringing hardware acceleration to uh, the application developer. Um, today, I'm going to discuss uh, a framework that we have been working on uh, that um, connects specifically FBGA acceleration to uh, big data uh, analytics. We'll discuss a little bit the challenges um, of this uh, of this such such an effort, and we'll discuss what kind of solutions uh, we try to develop. Um, first, uh, in this uh, talk, I will start with the uh, a little bit of uh, the challenges, as I said, uh, about integrating FPGAs in particular uh, into big data uh, uh, big data platforms, and then. We talk about one of the most important challenges in um, such an integration, which is actually bringing the data in. A lot of people work on the acceleration itself, on the on building the kernels, building the compute part of the of the application, which is the fancy uh, part of the application, the sexy part. But people keep keep on forgetting. All okay, right, now I have this fancy kernel sitting on my FPGA. How will I bring the data into the kernel, uh, to the to the uh, uh, accelerator component, and then how can I take it out to be able to get the speed up that I would like to achieve? And then we go uh, um, into the actual framework that we built and how that helps address this challenge. Talk about a couple of experiments that we have performed and where this uh, um, framework is actually deployed, and also come with some kind of ideas for future work. So we start from the beginning, and basically um, how the different worlds of hardware acceleration and big data analytics look like. This is what a typical um, FPGA accelerator developer perspective would be. Uh, people who work at that level developing hardware, basically they see the system at the lower end, right? The hardware side. And basically they look at, uh, first of all, um, data paths, and they talk about bandwidths of those data paths, and how data goes around on those data paths. They will write um, kind of a C uh, code or a library, uh, use a library on the, uh, on the host side. They talk about bytes and sometimes even, sometimes even about bits and how these bits are encoded and how you can actually bring data in and bring data out efficiently to the kernel and accelerator. They talk about specific structures and they actually sculpt a data representation and interconnectivity interconnect between the host side and the device side, uh, the FPGA side, uh, manually. It's an art. That's why David is there. So it doesn't happen easily. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. But this is how FPGA developers look at the world. This is their daily job. Now, if you look at the other side of the equation, big data frameworks. If anybody of you worked on big data analytics, you know that they work not at, at, the, at the total other end of the spectrum when it comes to computing. They work with higher and ever higher and higher level of abstraction uh, languages. So uh, they work with uh, uh, not even C, C++. They don't work uh, uh, now. Um, Java is, is popular there, but that's for them too hard and too low level. They work on Python. They work on R. They do SQL. Um, when I teach in a class, SQL and Python and R, I show this um, um, chart, yearly chart from IEEE Spectrum about new uh, languages, most popular 10 languages in the world. And Python has been shooting up in popularity in the past five years, and now it's actually number one programming language this year. And I tell my, my, my students, and it's not even a programming language, it's a scripting language. So, uh, so this is the other side of the equation. This is how the world looks like for a big data developer. They don't know a lot about the lower end of the uh, hardware. They don't know a lot about the, how to develop your algorithms, utilize your hardware efficiently. They don't know about data paths. They don't know about kernels. They just know about algorithms and the upper level. But we still talk about big data, right? We're talking about gigabytes and sometimes terabytes of data that you need to manipulate, bring into your uh, processor and uh, compute on and then bring them out. Um, so the question is, these are a bit, uh, uh, two kind of worlds, um, and um, most of this big data, actually abstraction, is enabled by a whole ecosystem 
of uh, solutions. So you have uh, frameworks on the one hand. We all know about the Hadoops, for example, Spark. There are also Pandas, of course. Uh, there are uh, different formats and data representations on the one hand. And you have the programming languages on the other hand. We talk about R, Python, uh, Scala, Java, MATLAB, and very tiny bit of C++ at the bottom end. That's as close as you get to the uh, uh, to low level in that world. And of course that brings a data transfer problem. Right? The higher you go in your representation, the further you go from the actual representation in hardware and the less control you have about bringing the data in and out. So this is at the moment is one of the most the biggest challenges uh, when it comes uh, uh, to uh, um, connecting the higher level with the lower level of exploration. Just to give an example, um, a very simple example, here is how a string, the most widely, one of the most widely used data types um, in uh, big data analytics or in any programming language, and this string is for a programmer, higher level programmer, big data developer, it's just a data type. They can use a string in Java, C++, and Python, or an FPGA if you have any idea what a FPGA would look like. But then if you look at, dig a little bit deeper, just one level deeper, and look at the representation of a string, the very simple string, in the different programming languages, you will already discover differences. So for example, in C++, you will see that there is a, some kind of a meta, meta type, uh, metadata, um, and then there is the data actually stored. The same thing, of course, for Java and Python. But you'll see that the metadata for these different languages are totally different, right? Internally in the memory, this data doesn't look the same. So when you develop a, an accelerator on a PGA, you would like to stream your data from your main memory to, um, to the accelerator. You will need to define that interface and make it interconnect, communicate well with each one of those different abstractions uh, in hardware. And that's just for a string. And when we d dug even a little bit deeper, we discovered that different versions, for example, of C++ have different representations in memory. There is no standardized way of representing this data, even for a specific programming languages. G different uh, um, different uh, um, compilers will compile differently to the, uh, to the memory. So that's, uh, uh, that's one, one, one major problem. So the, any program you develop, you will have to worry about what the programmer will do or what the compiler will do before you're able to port or use your accelerator somewhere else. And that brings us to what, if you want to still use your accelerator or even communicate between those different programming languages, then you will need to resort to what we call serialization and deserialization. And basically you will have a data collection represented in memory by a specific process A in a specific pro, uh, programming language, uh, in a specific way, you would like to go to a, another representation in the memory for a different programming language or for an accelerator, for example, or even sending your data through the network. And what you'll need to do is you go through a process of converting this data type, removing all the headers and all the um, overhead into a kind of packed, you serialize it into a packed representation of the memory and then copy it again and deserialize it into the specific representation of the target language or the accelerator that you want to work with. And that is a very costly process. You already see here on the board, there are two copies in the memory of the same data that already resides in the memory just because you want to use it in a different program or because you want to actually accelerate it. There are many different libraries and many programming languages that allows you to do this. But if you talk about big data, terabytes, petabytes of data, you can imagine how costly, in terms of time, this kind of copy would be. Um, so just, we did an experiment uh, about how costly would this actually be. Um, and uh, basically, if we think about F X FPGA or GPU acceleration, and um, your kernel would look like this, running on the CPU, and you developed an amazing accelerator, 10 times, 100 times faster, that would be represented by this green line. So this whole kernel on the CPU would look like this, as, as fast as this on your accelerator. You will have to worry about your data representation going through this accelerator. So you have to have a lot of overhead non-functional bots uh, um, pre-processing your data, running it through the accelerator, and then bringing it back, which brings your acceleration down significantly. What you want to have is that 
your kernel will be the biggest part of your compute, right? The other parts will be minimal. And that's what we don't have at the moment. We did uh, an experiment. Um, um, you can find it in a paper already published. Um, can the JVM saturate our uh, uh, hardware? And you will see that, um, for example, for um, various different ways of doing this data uh, serialization, deserialization, you will have to incur significant amounts of overhead. So here, direct, just accessing memory directly would have this amount of overhead and accessing it using one of the standard solutions in Java, using JNI, the Java native interface, which basically many of those programming languages, uh, many of uh, Java programs use, would incur, now this is a logarithmic curve, so 10 to the power of two, now we're talking about three orders of magnitude more time as compared to a standard uh, copy. So the question is, can we bridge the gap? That's the question. Can we, oh, 10 minutes, I have to hurry up. So, answer is, probably we can. Uh, there is a, um, a movement at the moment going on in the big data world. Uh, it's supported by Apache Arrow. Uh, that's a in-memory representation of data that is being integrated into various different programming languages. Now, it is supported by 10. I, just, I think they just added one more programming language. They are 11. We talk about all the well-known programming languages, C, C++. Um, um, Java, Python, um, and, and so forth. And then what, what, uh, what Apache Arrow does is that it allows you to get rid of all the serialization, deserialization copies of data. Basically, since you have an interface, a library for every programming, for many programming languages to access the same data in the memory, you can just use li that library and access memory that resides, uh, um, data that resides in the memory on the CPU, uh, on the host memory, and use it as it is. Um, and that's very important for uh, big data analytics because you have pipelines now in big data that use multiple different programming languages to do the work. It's also a columnar data format, which means that all the data of the specific type are uh, grouped together. So you can, you know where your data is in your memory and also it's contiguous. So all the data are stored next to each other. So it's very, very hardware friendly. So um, this is how data looks like. For example, in memory, you can define a schema, and the schema shows you what the data looks like in the memory, and then this schema basically stores any different kind of data type. Uh, you can have floats, you can have lists, you can have structs, define your own data types, and all of them have very efficient representations in, uh, uh, in the memory. So um, as I said, it turns out, it turns out, it was part of the design, that this representation is also very hardware efficient. Because it's highly contigu contiguous and columnar, your accelerator and or hardware will be able to know where your data is in the memory and try and be able to access it directly. And since it's a standardized in-memory data representation, if you develop your hardware to access that specific data representation, it will also be easily, without any other Reformatting uh, of the of the data will also be um, directly accessible by by your accelerator. Um, so this is what we did. Actually, we used this idea. We used this uh, um, big data um, data representation framework, and we built uh, Fletcher. And Fletcher is basically um, a way to be able to use Arrow data, Apache Arrow data representations in the memory, be able to copy it from the memory and then use it at the, uh, at the accelerator side. You'll see here how Fletcher framework looks like. So we have a compile time and we have a run time. And the compile time basically uh, takes an arrow schema, you know, the representation of your data, takes it through a synthesis step, and then generates interfaces that are optimized to be able to get the data automatically for you into the FPGA. And then basically on the, at the runtime side, there is an application on the host side that takes the data according to the specific application of the Apache uh, error representation, takes it, puts it in the memory, and then right away once it's in the memory, on the FPGA side, our automatically generated interface will just take this data without you having as a developer thinking about it, and then running it through your hardware accelerator. And then sending it back as well as an arrow uh, data uh, type. So um, how to compare a Fletcher workflow as compared with a typical hardware accelerator workflow? So that's a typical hardware accelerator workflow. You have a memory interface. 
you have um, accesses of bus uh, words coming into the um, uh, into the accelerator, and then you have a whole set of manually implemented interfaces that you as a designer have to develop before you actually use the computational part. If you use Fletcher, all of this is solved for you. So basically you start with from the memory interface, you have a Fletcher generated interface that is automatically generated if your data types are uh, represented in error format. And then this will just take care of all the accesses and also all the synchronization and also the, the data control. The only thing you have to develop is the computational part and you send requests about what data you wanna, achieve, you wanna get, you wanna read, and what kind of amount of data you wanna have and everything will be just fetched for you and communicated and interface with you automatically. So um, basically, the, a little bit more information about the generated interface. So um, we are um, developed our interface to be communicating easily with, the, uh, with a, a, a representation generating uh, based just on a schema. You generate uh, what we call buffer reads and, reads and writers, and these are buffers represent the columns. And then you can combine multiple buffers to create arrays, which represent the actual data types that you define as a, as a programmer. And then those array reader and writers are stacked into a, uh, a whole uh, interface, which represents the record batch that defined, is defined by your program. Um, this is how it looks like. So with the, pro the example that we just showed, that um, Apache record, uh, error record batch had three different uh, arrays, so uh, an, uh, um, an integer array, um, a, uh, a string array, and a structure, specific structure, special uh, user-defined structure. And then for each one of those, you will have an array reader automatically generated, and for each one of those columns, you'll have a buffer uh, in the um, a buffer in the arrow reader to be able array reader to be able to fetch the data and all the control will also be automatically uh, generated. We ran at the moment more than 10,000 different random uh, uh, schemas. Just test our benchmark our our uh, framework and it turns out to be uh, uh, and we fixed uh, uh, most of the bugs all of the bugs that we came across. It runs now in an open source environment, so we were able to uh, validate it already uh, in a cat with Cappy Snap. So, um, and it uh, runs actually on Nimbix, and also it has uh, uh, a port on uh, um, AWS uh, F1 instances. A Couple of examples, if I have a little bit of time. Um, so we ran a couple of examples. One of the examples we ran is a regular expression matching uh, experiments. And uh, basically uh, we um, assume that you have in the program n strings and you would like to match M regular expression, um, uh, expressions on your uh, N strings. Um, for example, I wanna check I love kittens in my, in, my, um, in my stream. Basically, you just define your data representation in, uh, in Arrow and then you push a button and you have all of your interfacing for your data automatically generated. And then you only need to actually work um, on uh, the actual regular expression matching kernel that will um, um, take, consume all this data and then generate the output and then sends the data out to the, um, to the uh, host processor. So um, a couple of numbers, this, these are numbers for the throughput uh, and speed up that we were able to achieve. We ran it on M uh, Amazon, AWS uh, F1 instances and on Power9 uh, with Snap. And um, I'm not gonna go through all the numbers, so we ran it with C++, Python and Java for both platforms. And um, the speed up that we can achieve is anywhere between 10 to 20, almost 20 uh, X on um, uh, a, uh, on um, Amazon AWS F1 and between 10 and up to 50 in, uh, uh, on Power9 uh, because of the speed that we can achieve uh, from the interface uh, uh, with Snap. Some more numbers, um, so basically this is, um, we did run this with uh, tweet-like uh, uh, strings, uh, one gigabyte uh, of data, and then you see, you see that in terms of acceleration, you have the processor is off the chart um, in the AWS uh, F1 case. It's still manageable in the powers fast enough, but still we are able to achieve much higher acceleration when it comes to, uh, to, um, to our implementation. So the pink part is what you get when you have serialization, deserialization, so that's the regular way 
of doing business without Fletcher. And this is the actual acceleration you achieve with Fletcher. You get rid of all your serialization, deserialization uh, overhead. So you still get better performance most of the times, not all of the times, with serialization. But with Fletcher, you also get rid of all of that serialization time. So I have one minute. So I'm just going to go right away to the conclusions. Uh, so basically, uh, what we developed is a um, um, uh, try to integrate FPGA acceleration into big data analytics uh, uh, frameworks. That is something that is not yet done yet, basically bringing together the big data analytics uh, field, which is highly abstracted, uh, to the um, uh, high performance computing uh, world, which is uh, highly optimized. And we were able to do that with, uh, with Fletcher that is automatically generating hard, uh, hardware interfaces for syncing um, data, uh, reading data from the main memory. And basically, this paves the way to integrating FPGAs into big data, uh, uh, ex uh, accelerated big data frameworks. Um, we have a number of efforts going on at the moment still. We would like to automatically make the buffer uh, uh, sizing for our interface uh, generated based on runtime um, runtime measurements. So we have instrumentations that allow this to happen. And uh, we're doing a number of projects, parquet to arrow conversion, uh, SQL defined, uh, uh, user defined uh, queries, and many others. And I would like to thank the countless people that have participated in the work. And uh, um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I have also a slide with a lot of different um, links to projects that we worked on, that we're working on. And I'd like to thank specifically uh, um, um, FitOptivist, the European project that supported us, and uh, Xilinx for their uh, contributions as well. Thank you very much.